My hair's lighter, my skin's worse, there's traffic outside, it's time for a video. So hey guys, how's it going? So apologies for immediately going on hiatus after the first video, but I had a series of unfortunate events happen to me, including, but not limited to, my laptop charger deciding to randomly self-destruct and uh, almost burn down my brother's new sofa and go up in smoke. You know, sometimes when life throws shit at you, you need to take some time out and just wash that shit off. And now I'm back to show you what I've been working on during the periods where the mayhem wasn't as intense. So today I'm going to be showing you the map that Laughing Man and I have created for our game Harrow at Home. And uh, I'll also be showing you um, a game design document and teaching you about why it's so important for a game like this to have a design document. And I'll also take you through, you know, some stuff to do with map building, some of the things I use, some of the things you can use, some of the things that everyone can use. So let's get to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I built the map. So, okay, the first thing we did was we looked at a bunch of um, existing boarding schools, had a look at their architecture, a couple of floor plans, and we thought about what would be in a, a boarding school. Um, and then Matt drew up a picture, a rough map. So at the minute we only have the ground floor and the first floor, or the first floor and the second floor if you're an American. So uncivilized. So what we have here is a rough sketch of the ground floor and then we have the second floor here. So what I did is I had this map and you can see it's it's gridded and I'll show you why in a sec. But what we're going to do now is we are going to boot up The Sims. Hell yeah. Obviously you can use more modern Sims games if you want. I just use The Sims 2 because it's my favourite. And let's face it, it's the best. Ah, oh, The Sims 2 takes me right back. Also, did you guys see the expansion pack of The Sims 4? It was just a Star Wars thing. What the hell is that? EA, who the hell do you think you are? You know, during the election cycle, there's like extreme leftists and extreme rightists arguing at each other, and I just really can't be arsed with it. I'm so glad I can escape to The Sims 2, where everything is just non-political and safe and... Oh. Don't be stupid, be a smarty. Come and join the Nazi party. Oh. Oh god. Anyway, I'm gonna breeze on past that and uh, head into a neighbourhood. I've called this neighbourhood London. The game does not take place in London. It's just it's what I thought of on the spot. Okay, don't judge me. And here we are. The very, very, very basic framework that we are going to be working off of for now for our game. I'm going to take you in here. All right, so as you can see here, um, I have basically recreated Laughing Man's sketches into Sims 4 map. Now, this isn't exactly what the room is going to be like. This just gives you a general idea of how things look and where rooms are in relation to other things. And it also helps you to just better visualize it. Um, it also gives you like inspiration on furniture and how you can kind of decorate and things like that. Um, little things like stairs are annoying because um, Obviously we want stairs here, the stairs in the Sims are like, uh, no thank you, you can't do that, but um, we have to kind of finagle it in. Um, it's just a template, um, things are subject to change, but that's why I had it in the group format so that I could use more easily translate it into this. Now, we do have a third floor. Um, we're kind of brainstorming what we want to do with it. Um, what I'm thinking is the third floor will be all of the, uh, I keep saying third floor, you guys have Americanized me, okay, it's not fair. Second floor. The second floor I think is going to be like all the classrooms. This is going to be where the matron sleeps. And this the stairs will go up to a fourth floor and this is where all the students will sleep. We haven't actually solidified this plan. This is just, we're kind of just playing around. But the first floor and the ground floor are actually pretty solid, we think. But um, we'll see as we go. So then what I did is The Sims 2 actually has um, built-in software where you can take screenshots of um, your stuff, but it's not very high quality in The Sims 2. Um, you can do it in The Sims 3 or 4 as well. And, you know, obviously if you want to build it in The Sims 3 and 4, you can. Uh, it's a lot easier for you. And you don't even have to build it in The Sims. This is just what I do, just because, you know, if you're going to build something, it's pretty perfect for that. Um, you know, it just makes it so much easier for me. But if you want to just do it in something else, you can. It just helps me to visualize it. I've always done it. Um, and I love Sims 2, so. And uh, anyway, enough of my rant. I will show you what I did next. Okay, so here is the scene that you guys all know and love by now. Um, but what I did is I created a separate scene called Map. And on here, you can see we've got the original sketch that um, Laughing Man did, and I had just kind of built on top of it. So if I get rid of the um, 
and that's for now. So this is kind of what we're working with. Um, I literally just went through, um, plotted down some floors and some walls, left spaces open um, where there are going to be doorways. And then what I did is I just created a very, very, very basic just capsule with a character um, controller so I could actually just explore my creation essentially. So here we go. Um, again, it's not going to be first person. You guys will know what it's going to look like, but this is just so that I can kind of see inside a little bit more so that I feel like I'm actually there so that we know how this is going to work when, you know, let me actually increase the flashlight um, thing because it's, it's kind of low right now. But yeah, this is just to kind of get a sense of the layout of the place. All right, so here we are. And what we were going to do is we're going to use this to kind of scale things as well. So this would be the dining room, with the high ceiling, and this would be the theatre. And then there'd be a stage here, and this bit would be like all the backstage. Um, everything that you saw basically in The Sims. Um, this will be the library, this over here will be the study, with a little stairway going up, I haven't put that in yet. Little stairway going up to this little balcony area. And then in here, you just got like a little passageway that goes upstairs. For now, I think we've got a pretty good base from which to work from. So what we were debating is whether we have the whole back the whole map already loaded into the scene and then we switch the cameras when you go in each room or if it would be better to just have them separate scenes my thing is if you're going to be chased through this it might be better to have it kind of like haunting ground haunting ground has it so that you don't really ever notice the, trans the transitions between rooms um it just looks like you instantly are in another room and i really kind of want that it kind of adds to the flow a little bit you don't have to stop and watch you know like resident evil old star resident evil you know sit down and watch a door opening and all that stuff right so um i kind of like the, the the flow of that um and i'm trying to debate whether um it would be easier to do that with different scenes or if the map was just all in one scene and the camera switching every time you go into another room now this all depends on how big the scene is gonna be um the artwork is gonna be just pretty much sprites so it's not gonna take as much memory as you know a highly detailed 3d environment but it all depends we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it but these are all considerations that i have to um you know, think about so that's where we are with the game right now we also have a bunch of artwork from mill coming in um and i'll probably show you those soon i'm really excited to show them because mill has done some fantastic work for us but right now i'm going to talk to you about game design documents so this is just um, a standard game design document template that's on Google. Um, I'll leave a link to this in the description, but um, I'm going to take you through it. Basically, a game design document is a document that you fill out and it basically has every single piece of information about your game in it. You do it before you do any of the designing or anything like that. And this is basically the seed from which every time any decision gets made about the game, you always refer back to this document. And it's also a way, if you're working as a big team, for people to kind of become on the same page. You know, if you're confused about anything, you can go straight to the document and it will have all the information there that you need. Um, obviously, the things that you write first in the document are not set in stone. They can change, you know, as the process goes on because making games is an iterative process. Nothing's ever perfect the first time around. But in general, your game design document is like the Bible that you go by when you're making the game. So I'm going to take you through it. Um, you know, you've got the basic stuff here, the your name and the game name, blah, 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 um, licensing. To start off, you just talk about your theme of the game and uh, some mechanics, what your game's all about, um, the platforms you hope to release on, how are you going to sell it? You know, is it going to be like a, a free to play, but you have in-game purchases? Is it going to just be available to buy flat out on Steam? Are you going to have a DLC, that kind of stuff? Um, how long it, you think it will take you to make um, and how much it's going to cost to make? This is something that you need to consider before you start making any game. If you're making a game by yourself, it's obviously going to take a lot longer. You need to break down each member of the team's roles so everyone knows who to refer to when they want artwork or programming or level design or whatever. You, can't, you need to know that early on. You need to think about your costs, you know, things like if you're releasing on Steam, Steam has a fee that you pay as a creator and then after you pay that you can put out whatever you want. But obviously you'll need to think about getting that initial kind of payment down. 
So you need to think about that. You need to think about other places, other platforms that you might need to pay to host your stuff on. Are you going to be using assets, you know, that cost money? Are you going to be using stuff from Unity Store that you might need to license or anything like that? You know, stuff that could cost money, you should think about and put it down now, even if it doesn't end up costing money. Um, Unity is free to use and it's free to publish your games with up until you sell the game and your company or entity exceeds profits of a hundred thousand pounds or is it dollars okay i just checked it was dollars but yeah once you earn over one hundred thousand dollars a year as a company you are required to pay for unity pro so you need to consider that too so now we get into you know the fun stuff you know what influenced you to create the game what games are you looking to emulate in some kind of way and then you got the elevator pitch which if you didn't know the elevator pitch is a concept where you pretend that you're in an elevator with somebody and you have the duration of that elevator journey to communicate to another person in that elevator what your game is so they get a complete idea so for example the sims 2 you would say it's an interactive doll maker where you can create your own dolls and houses and make them live their lives. You know, something short and sweet that doesn't take up a lot of time to explain. Just a very brief summary of what your product is. And then you've got like a brief product description where you can go slightly more detail and then a more detailed one where you can really properly get into the, all the nooks and crannies of your, of your dream project. You need to talk about your USP. So what sets this product apart? So for example, say if I was making the Silent Hill game after the Resident Evil ones come out and someone's saying, well, what makes your game any different from this? You would say, well, it's less action oriented, you know, it's, it's more kind of a, a, a low key kind of building type of horror rather than shock horror. You know, you just describe how your product is different from others in the market that other people might be more gravitated towards. What sets your thing apart? You go into slightly more detail about your gameplay mechanics and then you go into the story again. You do the brief one and then you do the detailed one. And then you go into what your gameplay is briefly and in detail. And then you need to think about what kind of assets you need. Is your game 2D or is it 3D? If it, even if it is 3D, you probably still need some 2D assets. Like if there's paintings or pictures in the background, you need to think about where you're going to source those. What are you going to use? Are you going to use Blender? Are you going to use pre-used assets? Are you going to hire somebody to make things for you? Are you going to do them yourself? What kind of programs will you need? And do you need to license them? Do you need to pay for them? Again, that should be something that you cover earlier in your cost sections. But if this is kind of prompting you to think about it, then head back on up there and uh, jot that down. But yeah, you need to think about sounds. You need to think about objects. You need to think about characters, even voice actors, if your game is going to have that. What kind of font are you going to use? You know, everything that you see in the game and that you hear in the game, you need to think about what they're going to be, where you're going to get them from, and how are you going to source them? Always remember that if you're going to be using pre-made stuff, you always credit the person that you got them from. Always remember to check the licensing of things that you use from online or things that you use from you know, pre-made sources. You do not want to be using a model in your game that's from another game that you have no permission to use and then end up down the line having to pay thousands for copyright infringement. In fact, it's good practice to credit everyone whose work you use, even if they actually say that, oh, you can use this product or whatever. It's always good to give credit anyway, just to be safe. But just beware whenever you import something from online or take something from another game and put it into your game because it might come back to bite you in the ass years down the line, especially if your game makes it big. So then you need to think about code. Some games are more code-based than others. You know, some games like visual novels can use a plugin like Fungus, which kind of takes a lot of the coding out of it and kind of makes it more simple to use um, for somebody who's perhaps isn't as familiar with coding in C Sharp. And then some games will run on loads of code and you're going to need somebody who knows what they're doing and can build that for you. And now along with the other assets, your code, you should also credit where it's appropriate. Obviously there are some lines of code that everyone are going to use. Like if you're testing, if your character's on the ground, you know, you're going to use a Boolean to check grounded equals true. You know, you don't have to credit anyone for that. But if specifically you're using a chunk from the internet that somebody's written as like a, pro as a, as a solution to somebody else's problem, just credit them, you know, just be safer than sorry. My number one rule of coding is don't do anything yourself if it's already been done before. If there is already a code out there that does what you want to do, then copy and paste. Again, always give credit if you're gonna do that, but when it comes to code, there's no point putting all that effort in trying to figure out a solution yourself if someone's already done it. Obviously, some people will have created similar code that doesn't quite do what you want, but it's close enough. 
In that case, if you want to kind of attempt it yourself to get something more fit into what you want, then go for it. But in general, see what's already out there. That's the number one rule you learn whenever you learn to code. Now here's where we get to the awkward part, the schedule. Now, however long you think your project is going to take, take that time frame, double it, add another two months just for good measure. I cannot tell you how many deadlines I have missed. People who are familiar with this channel are going to be like, oh my god, shocking. But yeah, these things take a lot of time and problems can arise from anywhere out of nowhere. And it really is like unexpected problems. Um, you'll, you'll be ready for release and then suddenly your game will crash because a line of code is wrong. And I cannot tell you how many times my code has gone wrong just because I forgot to put a colon on the end of a line or some stupid thing like that. And it's a common thing. So always give yourself time. If you miss a deadline, especially when it gets closer to release, you're going to disappoint a lot of people. Um, so you're just better off having that time. It's better to have loads of spare time than have no time left at all. Anyone who's familiar with the practices of big companies such as EA are aware of crunch times where the game isn't quite near to being finished and yet the release date is approaching and so the employees have to work god knows how many hours in horrible conditions, basically just being forced to work non-stop at their desks, not sleeping, not eating. You don't want to be doing that with your own team. It's going to create stress and it's going to create problems. You're better off in the long term just giving yourself more time. Now this is just a basic game design document template. You can add other things yourself if you, know, you feel like they're things you need to think about. For example, advertising. How are you going to advertise your game? You know, are you going to use Facebook? Are you going to be putting ads out on Instagram? Maybe you can contact a couple of Let's Players and give them a free copy and ask if they can play the game for you. And then also other things like, for example, you know, you can go into more in-depth character breakdowns. You really have a lot of money and we're really serious about pushing your game out there. Maybe even go into like merchandise, you know, anything that you think relates to the game, anything that you think is important about the project. Everything relating to the project should go in the game design document. So if there is something that you're thinking about that isn't already in there, put it in there. Again, it's what everyone is going to be referring to throughout the project. And again, it is going to change, you know, obviously the milestones might change because you might miss a deadline. You might change something in the story. But for all intents and purposes, if you do not know what to do, if you get stuck on anything while you're making a game, always refer back to the game design document. If it's not in there, then you need to either add it or talk to the head of whoever your team is or whatever. But by and large, the answer should be in there. So anyways, I hope at least somebody got some useful advice out of this out there. So I'd love to know what you guys actually think about the map layout. Um, obviously, it's, again, it's not finished, but um, I think what we have so far is pretty good. But if you've got any tips, if maybe if one of you actually went to a boarding school or something and you know better than we do how they're run, um, you know, just leave something in the comments. I also want to say a big thank you to the response that the first video got. I was actually blown away. I was actually expecting a lot more people to be taking the piss out of what I look like. So, so it's nice to know that I'm not the most hideous person in the world. But for real, I am glad you all enjoyed it. And it's one of the reasons why I was so gutted that, you know, I couldn't do this video until now. It's because I really wanted to get the series out there. But so lovely. So hopefully that's all over and uh, we can continue full speed ahead. But that's all I've got for this week. I'll hopefully be bringing you more next week. So I'll see you then. Bye.